Hello everyone, how is it going? And welcome to another episode of Reel Me In Colon A Movie Podcast, where you didn't really ask for it, but hey, I'm going to give it to you anyways. This is a podcast where I talk about anything, everything, and well, anything about movies. I'm your host, Chase Lee, and um, judging by the title of this episode, it's going to get a little creepy, it's going to get a little sticky, a little wet, and a little dangerous, but that's okay. I will hold your hand and I will guide you through it as we talk about... Fifty Shades of Grey, that's right, the most infamous book that spanned across three weeks of hysteria, I guess, I don't know, um, yeah, that's right, this, uh, this movie, Fifty Shades of Grey, is based on a book, and it's, uh, you know, the phenomenon of this book happened for, like, three months straight, and then slowly died off, like, each day after that, so, I, I, I honestly don't think it's that popular anymore, um, this is the book that was read by, uh, housewives who were bored with their sex lives, and coincidentally enough, the book was also written by a woman who was bored with her sex life. So we will be talking about Fifty Shades of Grey. So here's the agenda on today's show, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and that would be we're going to talk about a little piece of news that broke uh, about a little movie called uh, Spider-Man, uh, which ironically the main character, just like Christian Grey, also shoots white stuff out of his hands. Um, Actually, that's kind of fucked up, but when you watch Fifty Shades of Grey, you can kind of, I guess, accept the fact that Christian Grey might shoot sperm out of his palms. I don't know. He's a weird fucking dude. I don't know what he does in his spare time. Uh, So, that we'll be talking about that for the news, uh, how Spider-Man's going to Marvel. There's a bunch of trailers that dropped this week. This is, this is, yeah, there's six trailers. This is probably the most trailers I've ever seen drop in, like, one week period for movies so and then the movie review and then box office results for the weekend you guys know what number one is but you don't know how much so we're gonna get to that uh after everything else but i'm not gonna do this by myself guys because let's face it do you really want me to sit here and talk about 50 shades of gray by myself no because it's gonna it's gonna be weird it's gonna be like you know masturbating it's like it, you're doing it it's awkward it's weird you don't want anyone to see you it's just it's gonna get into some weird territory so I brought someone along. Now this guy, I've been subscribed to him for a couple of years now, and he does movie reviews just like I do. And he he's got over five thousand subscribers on YouTube. He's got over seventeen thousand followers on Twitter. He is the real deal, guys. He knows what the fuck he's doing. I don't. I should learn from this guy, uh, which I have been. Uh, he's one of my favorite uh, YouTubers online, and that would be Josh Lewis. How are you doing today, sir? I am doing great. It is awesome uh, to be on the show. I have listened a couple times in the past, and I know that we have sort of interacted uh, a little bit on and off, but I have continued, you know, checking out what you're doing, following, seeing what you're saying about stuff. And, you know, it's just, it's awesome to do a podcast. I love doing podcasts. They're so fun. They're so laid back. And what a better way to uh, jump into it uh, this week with the much talked about Fifty Shades of Grey. I'm excited. I'm excited about this movie news. I'm excited about it. This whole podcast. Well, well, thank you, sir. Uh, just to let you guys know, uh, Josh is absolutely lying to you. Um, he did not want to be on the podcast, but I blackmailed him because he, I, I videotaped him going into a CD kind of movie rental store in Detroit somewhere, and he rented Baby Geniuses too. I showed him the footage, and he I was. Love it, okay, I, I, I can't help it. I, I know, I know, I know. But like at first, you were very, you were very hesitant. You were just like, "Hey, man, like, can I have that footage? Like, can I burn it, please? Like, I don't want people to know about this." And then I was like, "Well, if you come on my podcast, I'll let you off the hook." And you're just like, "Can I do something else? Like, going on your podcast is equivalent to getting your balls clipped off by hedge clippers." And so I was like, "Listen, it's not that bad. Just come on. We'll, we'll have a good time, and I'll, I might bring my whip." So. Yeah, uh, that that just went there. So, uh, Josh, you you've never been on the podcast before, so go ahead and tell the peeps where you're from and how you got started on the Tube You. All right. Uh, well, I'm uh, a lowly Canadian from a I want to say small town, like really small town. We're talking like a couple hundred people tops. I went to high school with like two hundred people. It's you know. And, you know, I just, you know, one day I was like, you know, I like movies. I like I like talking about movies. And, uh, you know, I, I decided, you know, I'm going to go to the big city. So now I'm living in, in Toronto, and I go to film school at the moment, just finishing up the last bit of film school i got to do. And, you know, in my spare time, I, I, you know, started just making these YouTube reviews. And, you know, eventually they started gaining. People started liking what I had to say. 
and you know, I kind of went from there. Now I'm, you know, I'm uh, official press here in Toronto, so I get to see most of the movies I see uh, for free for the most part. And you know, it's it's a good time. This this is a this is a fun place to be. And I'm currently working on some some projects to develop some some crazy stuff. I might be covering some film festivals in the next coming year. So things are are moving for me. You guys can find me on YouTube at uh, Cywell Productions. Um, or you can find me on Twitter at the Josh L and Letterbox because if you guys aren't using Letterbox, you know you're not a real film fan. <laughs> yeah, there, right? <laughs> uh, no, I'm not on there, which means I'm not a real film fan. And Transformers is my yeah. favorite movie. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, guys, I've been following this guy for a couple years now, uh, creepily uh, staring outside of his window. But he really is a good uh, movie reviewer, and uh, we are press buddies because I'm also a press member in Dallas, oh. Texas here. So. Uh, well, we we got the hookups. So I have to ask one question. I always ask this to every single person I bring on. So you're from Canada. What is yep. the, I guess, give me the three stereotypes you have of people from Texas. Oh, from Texas. Okay, yeah. You're all, you're all gunslingers. Okay. Every single one of you. Okay. Um, there's, uh, what are those, the, the little fucking balls that, that fly across deserts? <laughs> the tumbleweeds? Tumbleweeds, yeah, like. <laughs> All of Texas is like just a bunch of tumbleweeds. Um, okay. Obviously, cactuses. Okay. Or cacti. <laughs> those, those are the main ones. And obviously, obviously, you know, there's the. We think the whole United States is kind of like backwards and stuff like that. But that's you know, Texas is like. You know, I I I, I know that Austin, Texas, is like an actual city. I know people that have been there. So we're, we're not that we're not that crazy. We're not Americans. We don't generalize all of you guys <laughs> Bre- breaking breaking news on this podcast austin texas is an actual city so uh oh. <laughs> yeah <laughs> well sorry guys I-, I know that it was kind of a rumor for a while but it, it is true he is not lying so uh, yeah uh to answer your questions um i do not have i do not own any guns except for water guns so that one's wrong uh i have not seen a tumbleweed at all since I live in the city, um, as far as cactus, as far as cactuses go, I kind of wish there were cactuses all around me, uh, like my apartment. So people would not come here because I live near the zoo. So it's always fucking busy on the weekends and I wish people would just go away. So, uh, those, the, yeah, th- those, to answer your question, those are the stereotypes. Uh, there's really, there's really nothing more. Uh, I have been to Canada at least once and I can tell you, it was really fucking cold. All right, moving on. So it's uh, pretty fucking cold. It's really fucking cold. Uh, yeah, the one time I went, I swear to everything, I got off the plane and there was like two feet of snow. I was like, "Can I please go back to Texas where the sun exists?" So, uh, <laughs> yeah, I it was it was a fun time in Canada, but I I just don't want to go back anytime soon unless I want to freeze my nuts off. So, uh, thank you, Josh, for coming on once again. So let's go ahead and get this. Uh, bitch started all right so let's talk about let's talk about the news you know i'm sitting at my computer yeah i'm I'm, I'm sitting at my computer and you know i'm on Pornhub like usual and so there, there's this thing that pops up on twitter that spider-man is going to come back to the marvel cinematic universe and you know i'm thinking to myself okay which website posted a rumor who was it raise your hand so i had to look it up to make sure it was legit and it is and if you guys don't they posted it up they broke it themselves they they did and i i believe it and they were not wrong so the news that uh broke this week was that spider-man uh that is owned by sony and marvel studios which is owned by disney you know because spider-man is does not uh not in the marvel wheelhouse it's owned by sony so they struck a deal and spider-man is actually going to have a standalone movie in July of 2017, I believe, in the Marvel slate of Phase 3. And then afterwards, Sony will probably create their own on their side. And so, hearing this news, I kind of had a feeling it was going to come at some point. Because Sony was in a shitstorm. Um, They needed something to kind of revitalize Spider-Man. Because, here's the deal. They got in a creative slump. That was that was really just. It. They, they really had no idea what they wanted to do next, so they were like, "Let's hand it over to the big boys." Yeah, exactly. <laughs> creatively, anyway. Exactly, and yeah, like that's what's weird is like after a while they're just like, "Man, we don't know what to come up with," and it's like, "Well, let's just give it up and let's give it to people that actually know what the fuck they're doing." That's actually what really bothers me about the Amazing Spider-Man too, because I know like I when I when I saw the film, I had really mixed feelings about it. 
Um, but the main thing is that so much of that movie was set up, and clearly they didn't know what they were even setting up. And that's that's what kills that movie even more for me now, because I'm like, you know, why would you as- try establishing this universe that you don't even know what you're going to do with it yet? Exactly. That's what's kind of weird about it, is that they're just like, we're so fucking confident that many movies will happen after this to where this is going to be nothing but build up. And I did not like the amazing Spider-Man two. There were aspects I did like, but overall I, it was a huge step down from the first one. So hearing this piece of news that just, it kind of, uh, makes sense in a way because, you know, Kevin Feige is like the Godfather at Marvel. So I'm sure, pretty sure he called Amy Pascal, the chairman of uh, Sony Wolf, former chairman. But, uh, at the time they made this deal, he was probably just like, you know, listen, Amy, I'll coddle you to sleep, and I, I will rest assure you that he will be he will be just fine. We will make the movie, and it will make a shit ton of money because we can make a movie about a talking raccoon and be successful. So, Sp- yeah. yeah, exactly. So, Spider Man. So, yeah, that, that was that was one of the more interesting elements of this deal too, because I don't know if you heard, but there was zero cash uh, in, in this deal. No one paid anyone money. Wait, for, wait. Uh, I'm okay with that. Like that that makes total sense to me. Like, it, okay, if you're in Sony's shoes. And Marvel came to you with this opportunity. You fucking jump on it. Like, don't even, exactly. don't even hesitate. Because Sony is is still getting all of the money from the solo movie that's going to be happening. Sony is getting, you know, Marvel's going to put their hand in creatively and let them put their uh, their brand on it, which is going to make them instant money, no matter what <laughs> they're putting their brand on. And yeah, that was they just said, you know, we're just going to put our brand on it, and but Sony gets to keep that money. But Marvel gets to keep all the money from the Spider-Man bump that they get from putting him in whatever movies they put him in, like Civil War, exactly. for example. So they can advertise that Spider-Man's going to be in Civil War, and they're going to get a money bump, and they get to keep all that money. So it, it's interesting that Marvel's going to be doing work on a film that they're not going to get any money from, yeah. which I think is the most interesting part. But they also didn't have to pay for the character either. So. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's okay, because let's face it, Age of Ultron going to make a shit ton of money and you know ant-man will probably do okay they are not in any type of money pain like sony is and so i i don't think they even need to have money to begin with like i think i think just establishing spider-man in their universe i think will just make fans go crazy and i think that's what they're kind of going after anyways i don't really think it, uh, it is about the money for sony it will help out a lot for all their future stuff but as far as like a standalone Spider-Man in the Marvel Universe happening in 2017, yeah, let's do it. So basically to uh, summarize what we were talking about, I'm okay with it. I mean, Josh, you don't have a problem with it, do you? Like, it's not like no, something... No, I, I, think, I think it's great. Spider-Man is my my personal favorite superhero. So I'm, I'm glad that at least creatively... He's going to be in, in, you know, in trusting hands for the time being. It might not be a, a, you know, a great movie. They might, you know, maybe they cast someone I, I'm not a big fan of. Some of the people on the short list I'm not really digging. But, you know, I'm, I'm glad that there's going to be more effort put in than the effort we saw in The Amazing Spider-Man 2, which was basically zero when it comes to script. Exactly. So I totally agree with that. So Spider-Man, guys, it's coming to Marvel in July 2017. Buckle up and get your shit ready because it's coming. So there was a lot of trailers that came out, uh, Josh. Uh, there were a lot of trailers, yeah. There were, and so I'll let you go first on this one. Which one would you like to talk about first? Ooh, do you know what? I think we should talk about the one that got me the most excited, Crimson Peak. Yes, Crimson. That was my favorite trailer that uh, came out this week. Oh my god, that fucking trailer! You know what? Give him out Del Toro. You know the Mexican Peter Jackson. I'm, if you're if you're ever listening to this, if like someone's holding a gun to your head and they force you to listen to this, you are just an amazing director. Like keep doing what you're doing. This looks like this could be one of his best works since Pan's Labyrinth. And definitely, yeah, I really like the cast: Tom Hiddleston, Jessica Chastain, uh, Mia, Alice in Wonderland. Blah 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 blah. Uh, I'm sorry. She's I, great. Yeah, I, yeah, she. I, I, I can't say her last name. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that one chick from Alice in Wonderland was great. Um, yeah, it looks really creepy. I love the, I love the vibe. I love the the props and the art direction. It just looks so old school and like Victorian esque. It you mix yeah, like some of that production design just blew me away. Like when they go inside the house and it's so big and expansive. And I, I just looking at some of the camera work he's pulling off in there, couldn't believe it. Like I'm, you know, this is like old school haunted house movie. And I've been dying for one of these ever since uh, Universal announced that they were gonna do, they were gonna try and do revamps of their 
their uh, their monster characters, and they ended up you know giving us whatever the fucking Dracula Untold was. They're trying to do you know turn them into action heroes instead. I was really hoping that they were going to go and do like old school haunted house movies, like do an old school Dracula movie, but bring it back and put it in like a shared universe. I was down with that. That was like the coolest. All these people trying to copy the Marvel formula and do universes. That sounded like the coolest one to me. Doesn't look like they're doing it well, but God bless. We got Guillermo del Toro here who is willing to bring that kind of movie back. Because Crimson Peak looks incredible. Right? Like, yeah, when Dracula Untold comes out, like, I never saw it. But what I can tell you is that <laughs> just by looking at it, it's like they took a, a cool idea from way back in the day and they decided to modernize it to, like, to a point yeah. where, like, it's not even, it doesn't even feel like the old source material anymore. And so the Crimson Peak looks gorgeous. I love uh, Del Toro's, like, cinematography. I love the way everything's lit. I, I love just the way it just looks. It looks like a, a really cool dark fantasy. And so yeah. Crimson Peak, man, it's it's becoming my one of my, one of my most anticipated for the year for sure. If you guys have not seen this trailer, for the love of everything that is holy, stop listening to this bullshit and watch this trailer, please. So yeah, it looks so good. It's such a return to form for him too. You know, back with his his old indie indie horror stuff, something like a like a mimic or a, or a devil's backbone, and you know, obviously sort of merging it with his his Pan's Labyrinth, which I think a lot of people uh, universally look at as his best film. Um, although there are the hardcore Hellboy fans, so we can't forget them either. But, exactly. No, this, this looks like a, a really great return to form, especially after Pacific Rim, which was a film that I liked, but it, it definitely was outside of his usual uh, his usual toy box. And you can tell that Del Toro, uh, you know, he he was working in a, you know a modern studio there. So taking it small again. You know, going back in some great actors and just putting them in this creepy haunted house that viewing through his, his this weird fantastical lens that he views the world through. I can't wait for it. Yeah, it, it's like the one thing I like about his films are very atmospheric. Like uh, Pan's Labyrinth is very fantasy like uh, Pacific Rim. And like he, it's very fun. Like he captures that tone of fun. And then, you know, Crimson Peak just looks like very old, creepy Victorian uh, type of uh, movie. And it just. Yeah, Del Toro is amazing. Crimson Peak, guys, October this year, look out for it. So for the second trailer, let's talk straight out of Compton. You know, fuck the police straight from the underground. Um, yes. Yeah, so that trailer actually dropped like two hours after I uploaded my last episode from last week. And I was blown away. Like, holy crap. The, the yeah. trailer was so good. I, w- I was not expecting a very you know, kind of real looking movie. Like it looks like they really capture the tone of these five guys in this, you know, rap group. I've, I've never like heard any stories on like how they started or anything. So this movie's gonna be completely fresh to me, even though I listen to their music, it just looks like a really good kind of biopic. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. And you know, what really struck me is like when the trailer got done and I was like, I was thinking about it and I was, I was like, Holy shit, this movie is going to be actually like, very relevant to today like with all the oh, yeah. shit going on in the news with you know uh you know racism and stuff with the police and i was like wow this movie actually is going to make a statement on this and it's going to be good i mean like selma did yeah, that it's, it's an incredibly yeah selma, selma yeah did it too, but it's an incredibly relevant uh story to tell right now especially especially this one because you know part of it was is people didn't realize, you know, what was what was happening to these people in, you know, in the hood, as as they would call it. People didn't realize like what life was like for these guys, and the only out that they had was through music. So that was what they did. They put it all into music. They they found, uh, you know, an interesting and eventually revolutionary way to um, sort of direct that anger, direct that pain, and they ended up sharing it with the world. And then all of a sudden, the whole world was watching them. And that's that's exactly you know what's happening right now. And you know, it's it's an incredibly relevant story to be telling. And honestly, until the trailer dropped, I you know I wasn't really following it that much. And the trailer blew me away. I had, you know, I was like, holy crap, this is going to be a, a very real and like probably an important movie this year. Yeah, and so I, you know, it, it actually like it it could I say could it could have some Oscar buzz by the time the Oscars happen next year. It it looks like that type of uh, caliber of film. So. I I'm looking forward to it, and you know, and you know what's really funny is like, uh, not really funny, but just kind of creepy. Ice Cube's son looks exactly like him, 
It's yeah, fucking it's weird. Awesome. It's <laughs> like, like you know, because at first, like when you heard about the casting, it's like, oh shit, nepotism at its finest. Like fucking Will Smith. Like he's pulling a Will Smith, and so, you know, I wasn't really too far with him casting his son. But when you watch the trailer, it's like you. He actually captures his dad pretty well, so I'm okay with that. So, yeah. straight out of Compton, guys, you know, uh, straight from the other ground, it, it's going to be some good stuff. I like, it, you know what? Fuck it. I'll say it. I like 8 Mile. You know what? I do. I love 8 Mile. Eight, okay. Great. Okay. Me and Josh, we're 8 Mile people. Like, that was a really great biopic about, you know, a rapper starting out in, like, kind of the slums and kind of just uh, gaining up through the ranks and stuff. So... It kind of had like that vibe for me, and so I, I'm really looking forward to it. So, yeah, all you 8 Mile haters, please come at me and tell me why you fucking hate it. All right, so <laughs> straight out of Compton, check it out. Very good trailer. Okay. So that's two good trailers. Um, Yeah, you picked the third one. All right, let's do it. Let's talk about uh, Aloha, or uh, I think I guess that's what it's called. Um, <laughs> Yeah, right? uh, it, could be, it could be called anything. Uh, People in Hawaii uh, is another one. Um, I, yeah, okay, yeah, you go first. All right, so I'm, I'm going to come out and say it. The, the trailer, it's it's not, you know, it's it's not special in any way. I mean, it's it's it looks generic to me. I get why some people are like, look at all these stars doing, you know, in, like sort of interesting things. Then look at all these people, and people are getting excited. But I, I can't get myself excited about a Cameron Crowe movie anymore. It's just, it, it's not going to happen. Almost Famous is a masterpiece but Vanilla Sky, Elizabeth Town, We Bought a Zoo, all garbage. Um, really? I I can't stand any of those films. You okay? Okay, I'll I'll give you Elizabeth Town, but you not even Vanilla Sky like at all. Nope. Wow. Okay. I can't do it. And I love Tom Cruise too. Damn. Okay. It. Although, granted, Vanilla Sky is the one I haven't revisited uh, the most recently, so. That that's the one that I, I could use a refresher on, so it's possible my my uh, I wouldn't be quite so harsh on it. But Cameron Crowe is soured in my book, and I don't know if he's got another great film in him. This so maybe maybe it could, but it, it it's not worth it for me to you know. I like Almost Famous. I like Jerry Maguire. Yeah, I I that's, that's about it. I agree with you. Like the trailer just kind of came across as mediocre to me. It's like, oh cool, look, everyone's having problems. There's there's life it's it's happening man cool like it, it just it didn't really like kind of get me like pumped up for anything um and and i, I don't i didn't really feel like there was like a, a tone to it i didn't feel like there was anything that no. it was going that it was going for it just seemed like here's some of the story uh come see the rest of it <laughs> yeah like it, it really didn't like capture like any type of uh any wonder or like excitement at all it was just kind of like here's some clips from a movie that these guys shot on vacation somewhere there you go. Like, <laughs> I was like, "Thanks, Cameron Crowe. Thanks for the vacation photos." So, I mean, it just—it's okay. Uh, That's pretty accurate. Yeah, exactly. So, I saw We Bought a Zoo. It was cute. It was charming, but it's not like something I praise about. I actually really like Vanilla Sky. Uh, just like you, I have not revisited it in a long time. The first time I actually watched it, I was confused as fuck. But like, when you start reading up on it, and it's like, okay, I can kind of see where everything was going. Um. But if, There's some directorial intent there that you can see. Yeah, exactly. You know, because, like, when I, I watched it, like, when I was, like, in the midst of film school, and now that I've kind of, like, graduated for a couple years and I kind of have, like, a better understanding of stuff, like, I kind of want to revisit it to kind of, like, pick apart it just a little bit just to kind of get across what uh, Mr. Crow was trying to uh, do. But, yeah, Aloha might as well just be called Mediocre Vacation Photos, so... Uh, view it at your own risk, I guess. So Aloha. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I didn't want to be so harsh on it because I think some people are pretty excited about it, but I just I can't. No, no, Josh, do not take back your opinion. Your opinion <laughs> matters. If you say it sucks balls, you stick with it. Don't don't take it back. <laughs> I I wasn't that that trailer out of all the trailers that came out this week was the only one to convince me probably not to watch the movie. <laughs> and I'm actually. Yeah, I agree with you. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, Aloha. There it is. Um, the next trailer. Let's talk about. Oh shit. Um, you want to do? Two more. Yeah, only two more. You want to do? Let's do Trainwreck next. Um, right. this is a film. This is produced, directed, and it's actually not written by Judd Apatow. This is the guy behind Forty Year Old Virgin, Knocked Up, Bridesmaids, uh, 
for getting Sarah Marshall. This guy's a comedic juggernaut, and I've been a fan of him ever since 40 Year Old Virgin. And uh, everyone in that movie, it kind of broke out of a lot of people like Seth Rogen and Paul Rudd. It kind of got them more noticed on everyone's maps. So Trainwreck stars Amy Schumer, and she wrote this one. And basically, it's just another romantic comedy d- done by Judd Apatow. And I say that very, you know, kind of like, eh, it's an okay movie. But no, it really, like, that. the thing about Judd Apatow is he takes, like, real-life scenarios and situations stuff, and he makes it humorous. He makes it kind of likable and with a lot of heart and so that's why i really enjoy his movies even though when you really look at it they're just kind of simple premises but essentially amy schumer plays you know a girl you know she was taught that men are evil douchebags and you know she sleeps with a lot of them and like you know she meets bill Hader, and they have you know a romantic relationship you know so it's not like the most in you know like it's, it's certainly not the most original premise for sure exactly that's that's what i was trying to get sparks like uh that grabs my attention from it anyway is uh you know it's it's a it's a reversal right like we, we've seen this movie before but I, I don't think i've seen this movie from from the, that female perspective though i don't think i've ever seen i've seen the guy who can't commit until he finds the one girl i've never seen the girl who can't commit until she finds the one guy so it, it is interesting that it, it seems to be flipping this sort of rom-com trope on its head a little bit and doing it from you know the perspective of amy schumer who is a really funny talented person so the fact that she's written it just gets me uh more excited about it because I, I like apatow i like a lot of the that he's directed but i think he kind of got into a, a bit of a sour spot with something like this is 40 I oh no here okay i didn't dislike it at all it's just it definitely you know it it was definitely the the uh the least apt he's been at merging his comedy and drama that one was a split it was there was comedic moments and there was dramatic moments and he had a hard time balancing it like he he usually does with because it, it was it was very serious film compared to some of the stuff that he handles more like a like a knocked up but i think knocked up is is, is incredible so yeah no i um, I, I agree with you like uh, here's the deal i like this is 40 and there's a lot of people that dislike it there's a lot of people that really love it i really like it but i do realize that it doesn't reach kind of like the heart that knocked up has um, yeah. But I mean, it's still enjoyable, and I still like Paul Rudd and Leslie Mann. Um, which Paul, Paul Rudd was the reason I saw the movie. I watch Paul Rudd in it like anything he does. I oh no, Rudd yeah, awesome. the, it, and this is exactly like even if Marvel has not made a good movie up until then, I would still see Ant Man purely because of Rudd because he's just he's just awesome. So I'm, I'm still in shock. We're living in a universe where Paul Rudd was cast as a superhero, like. This is this is incredible. This is we're living in you know in the times right now. <laughs> I, I forgot to tell you guys that Josh has been like frozen for sixty years and he doesn't he hasn't really grasped the fact that Paul Rudd is a superhero yet. So I, I'm trying to like I'm trying I'm training him to realize that Paul Rudd, the guy in Forty Year Old Virgin, is a lead character in a Marvel film. Just just let that sink in. It's okay. I know. It's okay. Or, it's crazy. I know. It is crazy, but yeah, Trainwreck looks good. Amy Schumer's in it. She's very funny. I'm looking forward to it, and so, yeah, it's Judd Apatow. If you're a big Judd Apatow fan, you'll probably enjoy this trailer. If you are not an Apatow fan, and This is 40 kind of left a little sour note in your mouth, then you might give this one a shot. You might not. Just watch the trailer, and there's also a Red Band trailer. That one's hilarious. John Cena, man, and LeBron James. They have some of the funniest lines like LeBron James line kills me every single time. Oh, the the down the Downton the Abbey, Abbey one. Abbey, yeah. Oh, I know it's it's really good, but I don't want to spoil the jokes for you guys. Go watch the trailer; it's really funny. So the last trailer, Josh, I will go ahead and let you introduce the last trailer. Uh, this is the man from I guess it's UNCLE. I guess that's is that how we're supposed to say it, or is it the man from Uncle? Um, this just sounds weird. I, I think I think <laughs> we should do it by the uh, acronym. So the man from UC or UNCLE. Uh, no, actually, let's go to Uncle. That sounds better. The man from Uncle. The man from Uncle, you know? Yeah, 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 that, that place. Thing. That, that Uncle. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, this this movie looks, uh, it, it's interesting. It's it's definitely like, it was the, definitely maybe the more surprising of the trailers that uh, came out, because I, I honestly hadn't really heard of the film, and I, I love Guy Ritchie. I'm a really big Guy Ritchie fan. So, you know, it, I'm excited, but I'm, I'm also wondering, like, you know, is we're we're getting three spy movies this year, three spy throwback movies this year. I mean, um, do we really do we need that that many? Because I mean, like, obviously, Kingsman came out this weekend, 
And it, it seems interesting that we're getting Kingsman and the man from UNCLE relatively close at the same time. And, you know, I, I think it's interesting that these guys are kind of doing goofy accents. I think Hen- Henry Cavill, you know, needs a chance to actually do a little bit more shining than he usually gets to do. He usually gets to just play a straight, a straight guy. Um, not the, and not playing like you know a heterosexual guy, but playing you know the straight man, the guy who's very very bleak, very serious. So it, it it'll be fun to watch you know him bulked up Superman style, but still you know doing something goofy and fun alongside Army Hammer. Yeah, I uh, so it, it it looks funny. It looks it looks neat, but I, I don't know if it's the one that I'm dying to see. <laughs> you know what's really interesting that you brought up is that there's a lot of spy films coming out this year. There's even a fucking Movie making fun of spy movies called fucking Spy. So with Melissa McCarthy, it's interesting. Right? Exactly. Somebody... What the fuck? Like, I listen. I understand that. Like, it, like when uh, Marvel released their Phase Three slate and DC released their Phase Three slate, and people are just like, "Won't people get sick and tired of superhero movies?" Uh, no and yes. Like, yeah, that seems a little bit overwhelming. But at the same time, if they're spaced out very far, then it's okay. However, this year, we have, like, spy films coming out, like, every single month, it seems like. And so, and here's the thing with superhero movies. Yeah, they seem similar. You know, the hero, villain, yada, yada, yada. But there's always something unique and kind of different about it. It just seems like, to me, all the spy trailers coming out, they're relatively the same. Like, I I don't know. Maybe I'm just getting sick and tired of the spy genre. I'm actually going to see Kingsman, like, either today or tomorrow, so I'm looking forward to it. But... There's just so many coming out this year. It's just like you, you kind of have to stand out. And obviously James Bond's going to take the cake. Everyone's looking forward to that one. But when you're a man from uncle type thing and you have to kind of stand out in the crowd, it, the trailer was okay, but it's not like something I'm just like, yep, the the man from UNCLE, man, that's what I'm going to fucking go see. And like no one's saying that. Um, it, it just looks okay. Um, I'm looking forward to no, see what... I was going to say, especially for Guy Ritchie, because... Usually I'm really uh, pumped by his trailers because there's there's so much style and panache in a lot of the stuff that he does. Something like a, a Rock and Rolla, for example, really stood out to me, and I really uh, got excited about that film just just based on like a style thing. But no, this this looks like um, Guy Ritchie, you know, being sort of uh, neutered by the studio system a little bit. It looks a little bit blander, a little bit more like you know, it doesn't have that standout quality to it. And I mean, I'm, I'm willing to be proven wrong. I will probably see it in the middle of the crowded summer season just because I see most things. But, you know, it's definitely not one that I'm, you know, I'm dying to see in this summer movie season, this crowded summer movie season. I, I am so glad you brought that up because when you look at Guy Ritchie's film history and you look at Snatch, uh, Rock and Roll, uh, uh, what's the, I, I'm blanking, what's the barrel one? Um, lock, stock, and it's- smoking barrel. There you go. Yeah. When you look at those films and they're like the gritty, stylistic, R-rated film that Guy Ritchie is known for, and then you look at what he's recently done and they're all PG-13, they're all kind of like lowered in quality. It just seems like two different directors and I don't know, maybe it's because he can't make his own movies, so he's trying to make some studio movies to get a paycheck to make his own movies. I don't know. Um it, that Yeah, it would be even next, he's doing, like, a King Arthur movie, right? Like, I, I yeah. really want to see Guy Ritchie, like, go back and, and do, you know, like, these these sort of, these very stylish, not quite gangster movies, but, you know, kind of these uh, criminal types, these these low, low-grade low people who are kind of trying to make their way up. Like, those those movies are much more fascinating to me. Uh, and, the, again, the, the last one that I, I liked that he did uh, was Rock and Rolla. I mean, the Sherlock Holmes movies aren't aren't bad, but they, they are definitely, you know, sort of... Uh, you can f- feel his style being washed away by the studio system. That he's not he's not being able to do Sherlock I- exactly the way he wants to. Yeah, exactly. And so I, I don't know, man. I really hope he goes back to like a snatch or uh, just something from that era where it's like these are really fun, unique films that you really want to know more about the characters. And yes, Sherlock Holmes was okay, but like, yeah, I just. Yeah. I just said, eh, Guy Ritchie, what do you do with your life? Okay, so that's The Man from Uncle. It's just another spy movie made from Guy Ritchie starring Henry Cavill, Army Hammer, which I firmly believe that that's a porn name. I swear to everything. He started, he started in porn, he kept the name, and now he's an actor. So, Army Hammer, tell us your real name. 
I'll slip you a I'll slip you a Benjamin. Okay, I'll give you a little hundred. You tell me your real name. So, the man from Uncle. It's coming out this year in the crowded movie season. Another trailer that dropped. I'm just gonna say it real quick. Uh, Hitman Agent Forty Seven looks like uh, RoboCop the remake. Moving on. So, Josh, Fifty Shades of Grey. You know this this movie. You know. Give it a great I, I, I'm going to try. I'm going to try to ramp this up into something really special. So, uh, everyone, get out your uh, lotion and towels. We're going to get a little creepy on you. We're going to get a little uh, disturbing and sexy at the same time. So, Fifty Shades is great. It's a book phenomenon. It comes out. No one really knows to, what to expect. The first time I ever heard about this book was on the news. And this is when it sold, like, an ungodly amount of copies in bookstores. And so you're thinking to yourself, like, it's kind of a good thing because at the time you don't know what the book's about. You're just like, that's cool. Book, this book is actually selling really well with people. I'm glad people are still buying books. But then you read what it's about. It's a girl. She meets a billionaire. And he's into BDSM. So you're thinking to yourself, okay. Okay, so this is a very successful uh, nationwide seller of an erotica novel. So you read more into it. Now, the premise, when I first heard about it, I was like, okay, it's interesting. But then you hear people read it. And then you realize the dialogue is equivalent to a freshman girl in high school who's trying to turn in an English paper and then she realizes that she's terrible at writing in English, and she's very horny. So the oh yeah, and she's very horny, and she's very and, and she's very horny. You have to you have to keep that in mind. Um, so yeah, the book comes out, everyone's going crazy over it, and the dialogue is like written by a horny teenager. So you're thinking to yourself like, what what the fuck? Why is this being so popular? And then you realize that a bunch of Middle-aged women really like it. And it's like, okay, yeah, I. This, this is definitely a book for moms. This is this is like moms wanting to feel a little bit dirtier. If you want to feel like they're doing a little bit, you know, doing something a little bit out of their comfort zone, but you know, just enough that it's hot for them. And you know, th- th- that was who the target audience was, and it sold a bunch of copies. That that's what fascinates me the most. Is clearly this book spoke to a lot of people. A lot of people were really interested in what this book had to say. And, uh, and reading uh, excerpts from it before seeing the movie, because I, I wanted to get an idea. I read the plot synopsis I went through, and I read um, a couple like excerpts that I could find online, a couple, uh, chapter chapters here and there, just to kind of get a feel of me, like what was what was getting what was connecting with people. Um, I, I have was, I have a th- it was trash. I couldn't I couldn't believe what I was reading. Well, yeah, it, it's an absolutely <laughs> atrocious uh, piece of novel to ever grace like our faces, but. I think I'm going to spin this in a different direction onto why I think this was a huge hit regardless of the shitty dialogue. Um, So, you're probably all wondering what we think of the movie. That's a fair question. We're two guys. That's what we promised to talk about. that, that, That is the whole reason why you guys are tuning in. I'm going to say whether I liked it, didn't like it, or thought it was okay... Josh is going to say the exact same thing, and then we're going to break this down. Now, I kind of cheated, and Josh posted on his Twitter. I, I I know where he's going to go with it, and but you guys don't know where I'm going to go with it, and Josh doesn't know where I'm going to go with it. So it's going to be I nice. Have no idea. I'm, I'm excited. I want to hear. It's going to be nice. It's going to be nice. What did you think of Fifty Shades of Grey, the movie? Oh shit! Are you fucking spinning this on me now? I'm supposed to interview you, Josh. What the hell? Uh, I'll I'll go first. I'm going to tell you. Whether I what I uh, thought about it, I thought it was okay, and I thought it was just an average romance movie from Hollywood. Nothing special. Um, Josh, real quick, did you like it, hate it, or thought it was okay? I liked it. Wow. Okay. So uh, you heard it here, folks. Two guys that actually did not physically hate it. Now listen, I'm not jumping up and down and saying this is the best thing I've seen all year so far. No, there's many things wrong with it, and we will get into that. I will let I will let my guest go first. Josh, give me your overall thoughts on the movie, what you liked, what you disliked, and are you looking forward to 
the future sequels? Whew, good questions. Okay, so, um, for the most part, I want to say that going into the film, I, I wasn't excited for it, but I wasn't anticipating it. And there's, there's a key difference there, because there was a lot of controversy surrounding uh, the material. And I figured that, you know, even at its worst, this is going to be a fun movie to, to hate watch. Um, and, you know, weirdly enough, I, I sat there and I was, you know, I was, you know, I, I hadn't really decided, but about like 20 minutes or half hour into the film, I actually started liking what uh, I was seeing. And I, it all comes from, these are talented filmmakers putting this together. And that's all it is. This is, this is crappy material. Uh, Kelly Marcel and Sam Taylor Johnson are the, uh, the screenwriter and the director. And their decision with the book was to approach it like it's trash. They, they recognize it's garbage. So what they did is they, they took it, they stripped it down to its most basic elements, they stripped it down to just the, the very core plot, and they were looking, what is, is speaking to people? What about this story is making this, you know, whatever, 100 million copies sold worldwide? What, what is speaking to people? Uh, and what they, what they found was uh, they you know, that there is an actual sort of empowerment self-discovery story going on there. So they removed the gross, abusive undertones that are in the book. They removed the, the inner goddess that this girl has that allows her to sort of, like, project herself out of her body so that she can, you know, she can indulge in these, these crazy sexual acts. Um, and gone are the over-the-top sexual acts or the sexual exploits. They removed them all. Um, so Taylor Johnson decides to just focus on this girl, this Anastasia girl, her power and her agency, her transformation from this this shy, introverted kind of person to a defiant, powerful woman. Um, you know, both sexually and uh, you know, worldly, because you know there there are uh, many scenes of her discovering new things in the world, going flying, going in a helicopter, th these kind of things. As there are her trying new sex positions, and there's there's real layers uh, to the journey that she's going under, uh, and you know there's there's genuine thought put into what she wants and eventually gets out of this uh, relationship that she's experimenting with, and that is where the film's focus, that's where the film's heart is, and that that spoke to me. That is an idea that clearly speaks to a large audience, and you know what? Yeah, this is a really silly. Uh, surreal, absurd film, but I I think it says a lot that you know we we need this insane surreal fantasy to get you know a studio movie about a girl safely discovering herself and her sexuality and her place and power in the world. You know it, it takes it it takes this insane female power fantasy to get a film like that. And if that's what it takes to get you know a you know a, a slightly interesting female perspective story written adapted directed and starring women, I say all, all the power to them. I think that there's there's genuine moments of emotional clarity and uh, and uh, and sweetness uh, in this film, all the while still embracing the uh, absurdity of this material's very existence, because the film definitely looks at itself as a joke. These people making this film have way more contempt and hatred for the material than I than I could possibly have. So watching those kinds of people, you know, revel in all the silly stuff, but also find the you know the emotional truth of the story is incredible. Um, and I mean, I I still am not team like this is a great film. It's definitely out of all the films I've seen in 2015, it's still probably near the bottom. But I I liked it. I I liked what I saw, and I think the people who were just brushing this off as like stupid, you know, female porn are really missing a lot of what this film is trying to say because it has a lot to say about relationships and communication like an actual sex contract negotiation session that is like one of the you know most uh hilarious uh metaphors that i've actually seen in a rom-com before so all the power to them that was a great overall view of the movie i'm not i'm not gonna lie i, I was pretty impressed like Josh did not fucking breathe, ladies and gentlemen. He fucking delivered that. Um, motherfuckers got game. All right, so I have to address something before I get into this. The whole everyone thinking this is porn. Here is the dildo, pun intended. <laughs> Listen, everyone has a preference on certain types of porn. Now, I'm going to go ahead and say this because I'm not shy about this. I watch porn. I like straight sex. I like lesbian sex. But what I can tell you is that there are people out there that like BDSM. 
And you have to really look at this movie from the perspective of every other rom-com ever known to man. When they have a movie with a guy trying to get a girl and they start a relationship and they have sex, if you honestly think about it, this movie is the exact same formula. It's just that they trade straight sex or lesbian sex for BDSM. And I think that's what's turning off people a lot about this movie is for the sheer fact about it's about BDSM. And let me just point out real quick, these sex scenes are not even remotely graphic. If you want to watch something graphic, watch Nymphomaniac. That shit will scar you. But this is like Disney. I swear to everything. These sex scenes are more of like, they're kind of like interesting on how like, like why they're shot this way and like they're they kind of look really good but i didn't really find them sexy but then again i'm not really into like hardcore bdsm like some people like because if you were into i wouldn't even say i think the bdsm community actually doesn't even uh you know they say 50 shades of gray isn't really like a, a good representation of them either and it's not like necessarily like bad they're just saying it's very very simplistic like it's very like, it's, it's BDSM for people who don't know anything about BDSM. Like, for, for moms who are thinking about experimenting with it. Like, it's it's just for them to feel a little bit naughty while they're they're reading about it. Um, You're right. It, it, feel, it feels yeah, kind of Hollywoodized a little bit. Exactly. And unfortunately, that's just that's what comes with the territory. Because as I said, they, Taylor Johnson decided to shift the focus from the sexual exploits, which, you know, unfortunately is like the main draw for a lot of people to come to this film. And she got rid of them to focus instead on this girl and, and her, her power and her agency and her journey that she's having. So unfortunately that makes the numer there are numerous lengthy sex scenes for sure, but that does make them very tame, vanilla, Hollywoodized. You know, this isn't gonna shock people. No. You know? Oh oh hell no. Like when I was watching these sex scenes, I was like, Okay, it's happening, but like there was really nothing graphic about it. And listen, whoever is my friend on Facebook, they have been posting this numerous times about this movie. Listen, this movie is not abuse towards women. First of all, she consents to this stuff and she wants to experiment with Christian because she loves the dude. She wants to kind of understand him. So in that regard, it's not really abuse. And she even says no to certain things. It's not like she just willy-nilly like spreads her legs open like, here, Christian, stick a PVC pipe up my cooch. Like, no, like... It's it's very safe. Yeah. Yeah, it's very consensual. And I know that there are sort of abusive undertones in the book. Correct. Sort of the intimidation methods that he uses, like almost like more emotional abuse. Like he sort of like stalks her. He does this kind of stuff. And those elements are in the film, but they are addressed as silly. Like they are addressed as this guy is kind of a goofy creep. Yeah. You know, like the, the, the film doesn't play it up as this guy is, is normal. <laughs> no. Oh, and, hell no. Like, it, it's definitely not uh, – because, like, I get people saying that about the book, but about the film, not a chance. The, the film is far more focused on, again, her power. She has a lot of power where he, ha- he has the power in the bedroom, you know, and she, al- and she allows him to have that power. It's her agency. It's her decision to allow him to have that power in the bedroom. But outside the bedroom, she has the power. It's her defying him. You, and it's, you know, you know, what's really uh, interesting about what you just said, like in the movie, like she has the power over his power to control her. Like, it, it's really, it's really weird. Like she kind of flips it on him and listen, I've never read the sequels and I, nor do I want to, I, I actually kind of want to finish this series. I actually have an idea of where it might go because of how the last shot kind of portrays itself in the film. Um, but I'll, I'll get to that in just a second. So I had to address the whole abusive thing. Listen, if you don't like to watch porn, you think it's like the devil's work, that's fine, whatever. But there are people that do watch it and people do get off on this stuff and you have to realize that this is not abuse. There are people that like this, they like bondage, they like uh, sadomasochism and they like domination, submission, whatever, what have you. It's just the way people are. It's preference. It's the same way with like sexual orientation. Some people are gay, some people are straight. It's just the way of life. Not everyone's going to like just straight everything. Yeah, Sorry. And this, and this film gets the idea across that, you know, it, his wants, as long as they are done safely and consensually, they are fine. And, you know, there, you know, there, there are a few turning points where he goes, sometimes he goes a little far, but it's, it's nothing, you know, it, it's nothing that she doesn't uh, consent to just to see what he wants. You know, she's trying to understand and discover him. And that's what makes this, you know, one of the more compelling romance films 
because um, I find in a lot of romance films, it's just you know, it's it's two people. They sort of have like a misunderstanding of each other, or there's you know, there's a small little mishap or something like that. But this is a film genuinely about two people trying to discover one another, and that is it's honestly rare to see nowadays. So the fact that they you know they took this really trashy, you know, sort of. Uh, this porn fantasy and they turned it into something that has genuine romance in it is you know kind of interesting and yeah the sex scenes they're they're a little boring but i mean it is the mpaa this movie had to go through the mpaa so of course it wasn't going to have some of the crazy stuff that people were talking about in the book but you know i i kind of appreciate the fact that they they toned it down and decided to tell a real story and that's probably the most surprising thing is that this film is a real film trying to say real things and so the fact that it's not as as scandalous as maybe people are expecting really didn't disappoint me in any way i was i was impressed that there was just you know real story there <laughs> yeah no and the weird thing is i actually agree with you i didn't like it as much as you did but i i agree with everything that you're saying you know like the film let me uh, I, okay i had to get the whole abuse thing out of the way because it was it was bugging the shit out of me so let me oh, go yeah, ahead because i've seen a lot of people posting it you know sharing articles on yeah it, and it, it's really hard you know as, as two guys to say why it's not why this doesn't look like abuse on 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 women but i, I genuinely believe that the, the film even if the book did do such things which i read parts of it and it does seem that way but I really think that the film and the, the female creators behind the film put the female perspective on it and really, uh, you know, really fixed it, really fixed uh, those elements of the film. So I think, and if people are boycotting the film uh, because they they don't want to support, you know, those elements of the book, I say go check the movie out. Go see for yourself. Go see if those elements still made it in the film because I am totally willing to listen to some, some counter arguments. But watching it, I had my eyes open for the abuse. I was looking for it, ready for any reason to hate this thing, and I, I couldn't find it. Exactly. That, that's what kind of strikes me the most is it – people are claiming it's abuse and it's terrible and then when you watch it's like no this is actually a lot tamer than you actually think and it, when i walked out i i immediately said to my girlfriend who i saw with and she she liked it as well there were, she actually had the same problems i did so uh i'm glad that uh she saw those but like it, when you walk out of the movie you go that was just an average romance movie from hollywood they just switch out straight sex and or lesbian sex or gay sex for bdsm like there was really nothing surprising, and I really liked. I liked the way it was shot. Well, the thing I would say about just about BDS, like it being BDSM, is that it's it's experimental, right? So I, I think that, that that plays into a little bit. It makes it just stand out a little bit more to me. Like that's why it stands out more to me is because this is about a girl. Like it's very rare that we get a film about a leading girl safely. Uh, experimenting and you know going on a journey of self discovery and of world discovery at the same time. So I mean, like the, the fact, like there's not a whole lot of romance uh, or rom coms from that perspective, which is why I think Trainwreck will be interesting too, because that's kind of like, you know, it's it's the female perspective on this stuff, and that that's what interests me. And you know, if if it takes really trashy material uh, to you know get a movie about that, I'm I'm totally. Uh, cool with that, but the sex is is really boring. Yeah, no, it, it really is boring, and it's actually not very sexy, which I, uh, which is one of the reasons why I didn't like this movie. I really do not buy the chemistry of Dakota Johnson and Jamie Jordan. Like Jamie's, oh, a I forgot we, we forgot to talk about the actors, but Dakota Johnson, you like Dakota Johnson? No, I. I thought she was, you didn't like her? No, no, I really do. Oh, no, okay, so I was gonna say I, I thought she was great, but Jamie Dornan is no, know, he's awful. He, he's, not, he's not given anything to do, unfortunately. So I, I don't know how much of it's his fault, but he's really stiff and boring. No, that's that's yeah, that's what I was getting. Like she actually really, you could see that she's trying, but then when, we, when it cuts to him or when he's saying something, everything just seems to come across as wooden or like he just doesn't give a shit. I I didn't buy their chemistry, but I love the fact that Dakota Johnson. Um, gave it her all and she tried to make it work kind of like it's almost like the relationship in the movie she's trying really hard as her character to make the relationship work because she wants to understand christian and why he does this and she wants to she loves the dude and so she's just trying to kind of get through him and whatever yeah, yeah, that was why i didn't i didn't mind it that much he was he was definitely you know he was textbook kind of like creepy hunky fantasy-esque um but and he, he was a blank slate, and you know it was because that's what he's supposed to be designed to be. I think I think it's he's meant for the females to uh, you know sort of project onto him in that way, and I, I think it works because she sort of projects onto him a little bit, and then once he opens up in the film, he later on in the film he gets to sort of uh, you know express a little bit about who he is, give a little bit of a backstory, um, you know. 
you start to not necessarily like appreciate or, or understand him, but you, you know, he becomes a, a little bit frightening after a little while. And they compare him at one point to a serial killer. And I thought that that was pretty accurate. Yeah. <laughs> no. And like, I'm glad you brought that up because I, I never read the book. I never had any yeah. like recollection of like what was going to happen or like, I, I went in purely blind. And so the, I did not know that Anastasia was a virgin. And so for her losing her virginity to this dude and wanting to try new things and kind of experiment into this kind of like, uh, you know, sexual territory, it makes sense now. I, because a lot of people are, are, you know, understanding like why she stayed with him and why she kept going back if he was abusive and she wanted something more that he didn't really want. And, you know, they kept going back and forth like an actual couple. I understand now why she kept going back to him is because she was a virgin and she lost her virginity to this guy who she really cared about and so she kind of has a draw to him naturally and she really wants to kind of be with him because she she you know cares well, a lot I, I was gonna say she sees you know she sees that the good elements of him that are that he that he's trying to hide uh in that way because clearly he's insanely emotionally damaged for reasons that aren't fully explored in the movie but i'm guessing is part of the huge plot of this epic trilogy yeah uh so i, I didn't i didn't care for the backstory i didn't care for the the reasoning behind it but i you know you could tell that this was just an emotionally damaged guy and you know you know maybe a film about a girl trying to fix a guy isn't necessarily the best thing in the world but you know there it's still very genuine and sincere the way that she wants to approach it it's not just her fixing him it's you know her finding a guy that she thinks makes her better and makes you know her a more you know uh, discovered person, and and wanting to be with that person. So I you know I, I I got that side of it and I was I was willing to you know get involved in it. Yeah, I I I totally I totally agree with that. And but the the thing is like you, you and I understand like the characters and where they come from. But one of the major issues I have with it, of course, it's no one's fault because it is adapting the book very well is the trashy dialogue and how it's delivered it just listen and i'm gonna say the most unpopular thing right now and if you unsubscribe from me i fucking know why now this movie okay. if you think about it is in the same realm as gone girl from last year now hear me out no, Go- I agree with you. gone girl is like a lifetime movie it is a very it just feels very TV movie esque, but the only difference between that and this is that Gone Girl is elevated to like such a high film caliber that you kind of can excuse the fact that it's basically a lifetime movie. It's like a an erotica novel. Oh yeah, Gone, the thing that this and Gone Girl have in common is that they they both have trashy qualities to them, and I, I brought this up in my review actually when I was talking about uh, the sex. Um, was just that, you know, they, uh, where Fifty Shades is trying to sort of hide some of the trashier elements, and then it, it, they kind of just, they appear in the dialogue. Fincher had the right idea when he doubled down on the trashy qualities of Gone Girl. He said, you know what, I am going to embrace the little bit of, uh, you know, trashy, sort of like very surreal, melodramatic uh, elements of this book. And I'm going to use it uh, thematically. I'm going to, you know, actually apply it to the film. And that actually, I think, elevates Gone Girl hugely. You know, it was one of my favorite movies of last year. Yeah. And I think that that's, a, you know, part of the reason is Fincher's uh, way of engaging with the material. And I, I brought up that I, I thought Fifty Shades would have benefited from um, engaging with its own trashy qualities a little bit more. Even going as far, because I brought it up uh you know, in specifically in terms of the sex, I said that you know maybe one or two more bedroom shocks might have actually given Fifty Shades, uh, you know, a little bit more of a pulse to it. <laughs> you, you know, uh, like it, it's funny that I I brought up the whole Gone Girl thing, and I'm glad you kind of agree with it. Like, Gone Girl had like a dark comedic tone to it. Do you do you think that Fifty Shades of Grey could have actually benefited from this? I, I think it could have. I think there's a couple times. I think that unfortunately, this film goes back and forth between sort of realizing how ridiculous uh, the material is and sort of like not parodying it, but kind of like playing it up as ridiculous. Yeah. Um, and then it goes back from taking it completely seriously. Yeah. And, you know, it kind of gives you a little bit of whiplash going between those scenes. It makes the ones where it takes it seriously kind of come off unintentionally funny. 
Um, and you know, that's, that's where, that's where the majority of my issues with 50 shades of gray is. And some of the scenes that I didn't engage with, like when Jamie Dornan is like, I'm 50 shades of fucked up. Like nobody could have delivered that line sincerely. No actor in the world no. could have delivered that line yet. They went for it. You know, and, you, you get someone like Mark Wahlberg to try to deliver it. It's like, Hey, how's it going over there? I'm gonna have a, Hey, uh, Hey, you know, that thing over there, it's like 50 shades of fucked up, you know, like no, no one. No one in the right fucking mind can deliver any of this dialogue well at all. And I think that, like what you were, you and I were saying, like the direction of this movie, I think Sam Taylor Johnson, she knew what the fuck she was doing. And I think kind of embracing that and just kind of just rolling with it. And I think if they took like the Gone Girl aspect and made it kind of like more darkly comedic and kind of played with itself a little bit more, uh, pun intended, then it could actually be kind of a, a even better movie than what people are making it out to be. It's um, just a, I was gonna say, it's just a consistency thing. It's that David yeah. Fincher committed to one one style and tone, and he went with it for the whole movie. And and the the film benefits from that, where you can tell Fifty Shades of Grey somewhere in the studio system is being pulled in two different directions. Where Sam Taylor Johnson wants to tell this real romance story with a little bit of you know a a, a, a skip in her step, a little bit of a wink in her eye, where she's kind of pointing out how silly and ridiculous this story is, but that there's genuine stuff underneath it. And that's the story she wants to tell, but then there's, you know, there's either the author or the studio saying, no, I want you to adapt, you know, the, you know, in this is serious kind of way. And so, unfortunately, the film feels like it's trying to do a little bit of both, and it doesn't work. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot of confusing kind of tonal arrangements in the film. Like, there's some, there's actually, like, parts. I'm not even kidding. There's, like, parts where they're trying to be funny. And... It, like when those parts happen, like the people in my audience were just like, ha, "Oh, that was great! I haven't seen a comedy since 1985." And now, you know, I'm sitting there going, "Like, like really? Like, come on! He's about to fucking whip her in the butthole, and you're making like an Xbox joke. Let's calm that down, Fifty Shades of Grey, and let's take a step back and realize what you did, and you should be punished and go sit in the corner for a little bit." So, I mean, overall, like, I I do like the direction that Sam Taylor Johnson took, and I do like the. The characters in the film, and I like Dakota Johnson, but Jamie Dorn is awful, and I do not, I do not like the dialogue at all. It just, I know that it's adapting from the trashy source material. So yes, if you want to look at it that way, it's a great adaptation. But things work in the book for a reason. They don't really translate well to the big screen. You're not going to just go to Walmart and go in your $5 book section and take some random erotica novel that's probably called Space Probe and Butthole 6, and you're not going to make it into a film because it wouldn't translate well into a big screen adaptation. It just wouldn't. You would have to change a lot of stuff up. Fifty Shades of Grey kind of you know kept that same tone a little bit. It just didn't really work for me. Um, but I, 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 do ha- I do have to say that even though like the dialogue is trashy and kind of in a fun way and Dakota Johnson gives her all Josh, you have to agree with me on this. It was actually shot very, very well for this type of source material. Oh, for sure. Uh, I ended up looking it up and found out that it was uh, Seamus McGarvey who shot it, who actually shot uh, last year's Godzilla and he shot uh, the Avengers as well. So they, they got a talented guy to, to come in and shoot this thing. Um, and it's it's very sleek. It's it's very well well composed, and, I, and it's glossy. Um, unfortunately, I think the only issue there is that there's really not a whole lot of interesting things for him to shoot. I think a lot of the the production design is it's very bland and gray on purpose. But yeah. everything is kind of like varying levels of bland. So I you know I, I wasn't too there wasn't a lot of opportunity for him. But when he is given the opportunity, he does shoot some really cool stuff uh i'm thinking specifically uh the plane flying sequence when he gets to toy a lot with sort of space and motion uh in there i don't know if you know the sequence i'm talking about but that that yeah. sequence was really really well shot and i was really glad that it was in in there because honestly i think it's you know because again this is about her sort of discovering herself in the world and uh i think that that sequence is actually a better version of her discovering herself in the world than even some of the sex scenes are yeah no it, like when you're watching the movie, like as a film buff, as a regular person, like you can you can't sit there and tell me it was shot poorly. It's actually shot very well at Josh said. It's like it's kinda got like this glossy, kind of fantasy feel feel, kinda like the the book does. And so I actually really like the way it was shot. And I'm really glad that you brought that up that Seamus uh, McGarvey shot this. As I was sitting there and the credits were rolling, I was seeing these names to where I was going, 
holy shit, they actually got some recognizable people. The first one was Seamus McGarvey. I was like, no way. The fucker that shot Avengers is shooting this movie? Well, it kind of makes sense. You know, Sam Taylor Johnson is married to Aaron Taylor Johnson, who was also in Godzilla, and he's going to be in Avengers 2. So, you know. He's definitely worked with McGarvey. Yeah. Exactly. And then another thing that shocked me was when the credits rolled and Danny Elfman did the music. I was like, what? What? That one surprised me. I know. I was like, what the fuck is this? Like, this is actually turning into a legit piece of film that people want to work on. What the fuck, man? Yes, there was talented people who put this together, and that's why I think that the films... I, I think that's the reason the film stands out, is that this is this is trashy material. But again, this is... You know, these are talented people turning into a film, and it's the kind of thing where, you know, sometimes a bad book can turn into, you know, a decent film. Yeah. Just because it's, you know, it's, it's a film is a collaborative thing where many, many people get their hands on it and, you know, try and pull it in each direction. Yeah, so, I, I, I totally agree, and... We have to talk about the uh, the soundtrack because let me just bring this up. Every time when the sex scenes happen, yeah, they were shot well, they were lit well, they kind of captured this kind of weird fantasy element about it. But at the same time, uh, it wasn't sexy to me. But what I found really sexy about the scenes was the the music. I actually really dug the soundtrack. <laughs> I thought that was actually sexier. I was gonna say, as soon as they they uh, they did the the one like sex scene to Beyonce, I was like, all right, I'm in. I was a pretty I was pretty happy with that scene. Yeah, no, I, I was like, I was like, you know what? If I can't pop a boner from this BDSM, I'll pop a boner from Beyonce's voice. So, uh, I, I thought it, I thought the soundtrack was actually really cool. But to kind of wrap things up, Josh, what? I have to ask you this question because this is actually like one of the biggest reasons why I kind of want to. I, I like this movie kind of is i'm actually really curious as to what the fuck's gonna happen in the next two like yeah it is a trashy movie and it's not a very good movie but at the same time it does capture my curiosity and i can't fucking lie about that so does it really capture like that curiosity for you like please tell me i'm not crazy and like you actually kind of want to see two and three I, I'm definitely going to see two and three. Yeah, um, and I'm not. I'm not sure if it's it's any any form of excitement again. I think it's more of a curiosity, like where exactly. could we possibly go with this? But I don't. I don't. I don't know that it's going to make me feel better about the, this film. I don't know, or it's going to make me feel less about this film. I think that like I would be just as happy if this was a standalone film. I mean, it it ends on a cliffhanger, and it's maybe not the most satisfying um, way to to end a film, but. I would be just as as pleased with this film if it was just its own its own thing. But at the same time, uh, clearly, you know, the fact that this is a, like an epic trilogy kind of uh, has me intrigued uh, in a way that uh, I don't know. Say, uh, probably other studio films won't do for me this year. So I am willing to go see the the sequels, and I'm not. You know, I have no hope that they're going to be even remotely as. Uh, as good as as this one, but if you know if, if they're keeping the same crew, if Sam Taylor Johnson is going to do the same thing to those books that she did to this one, maybe you know maybe it's possible that we're going to get a decent romance trilogy, which and, I don't think I've ever seen before. Oh uh, well, uh, I mean other than obviously uh, Linklater's. Uh, yeah. Oh yeah, <laughs> that, that's a great trilogy. But uh, yeah, this is almost like the trashier, like raunchier version of that. But like you know when the movie ended, like I, I'm glad you brought that up. The fucking cliffhanger. Listen, I am fully aware that this was a three-book series when I walked into this, but I had no fucking idea that this movie, it, it couldn't really stand on its own in a way, and it couldn't, like, complete some arcs or anything. It just, it literally left everything in the air, and it's kind of... Yeah, it, there, there wasn't one arc that it, it ended in any sort of satisfying way, and that was one of my main issues as well, is there's, they start off all these little plot lines, all these little subplots, and none of them get addressed later. Not even one. We don't even... Like, I'm still unsure what Christian Grey even does as a business. He just sits there on his phone in the background, and he goes, business, 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 business. And then he gets... Every once in a while, he gets angry, and he goes, business, business, business. Yeah. And, like, that was... Business like, shit. Yeah. Like, I have no idea. Reminded me of Princess Unikitty from the Lego movie. <laughs> yeah, I know. Like... That when it, when it ended, I swear to everything. The lady that was sitting next to my girlfriend on her right, because I was on my girlfriend's left, she she was like, "What the hell was that?" <laughs> and like, I I thought the same thing. I was like, "You speak it, you speak it, sister. I agree with you." Like, what the fuck was that ending? And yes, I I kind of dug the last shot of the film because it it ties into the first time they meet. But 
Yeah. And, but at the same time, I, I felt like I just watched a two hour TV show and I was like, really? You couldn't complete at least one fucking arc in this entire thing. But to its film's credit, even though I thought it was just an okay movie that had some qualities about it I enjoyed, I am still curious for the sequels. And I think that's the biggest compliment I can give it. It is not the best movie I've ever seen by a long shot. I like Dakota Johnson. I like the way it was shot. I like the way her character was handled. But I hated the dialogue and I hated Jamie Dorden. And I hate the fact it didn't really tie anything up. But I am curious. I have to just... I have to say it, guys. I, I, can't, I can't fucking lie to you. Why would I lie to you? Why would I, ta- why would I take your hand softly on this journey and then just completely bash it? No. I gotta, I gotta go in there with an open mind and tell you it's not a bad film. It's not a great film by any means. And it's just an average Hollywood romance movie. It really is. And so, uh, Josh... Go ahead and tell the the kids listening. Uh, what what would you give this out? Like what uh, your rating score? Like what what number would you give this? I was gonna say surprisingly, I actually rated this a little higher than everybody else on Letterboxd, but I actually gave this three out of five stars. Okay, I uh, because I was gonna say that's that's usually what it takes for me to give a positive review, and usually five and below that's a negative to me. Uh, so anything that's like positive, the lowest positive rating I can give is is uh, is three out of five, and that was that was uh, you know. That was what I gave uh, Fifty Shades of oh, Grey, a movie I surprisingly had a, had a decent time with. And we seem to be a bit in the minority. I think I think a lot of people really hate this movie. You, you know what's really strange is that people are going to click on this podcast and they're going to expect a, a complete bash fest. And yes, we have our problems with the movie, but I'm not going to... I was going to say, I've seen a lot of people bash this movie in, in their reviews. And I honestly, I, I, I think that there's just like a fundamental misunderstanding of, of the film going on there. I think people are just really clouded by the hatred of the book. To yeah. even give the movie a chance, and I think if those people did, I think that they would find that there's something kind of real hidden underneath there. So, yeah, I I, I totally agree. And listen, guys, if you're listening, like me and Josh are not saying this is fucking Citizen Kane or anything, but we are saying it's not this piece of garbage that no, people I, are. I, I was gonna say, I think it's still the worst because I haven't watched a whole lot of 2015 movies yet this year. I usually do a January catch up later in the year. Yeah, just so you know. I don't spend a, a ton of money watching all these crap films that I regret spending money on. Um, so yeah, like I've only seen like four or five movies so far in 2015, and it's definitely the worst one I've seen. <laughs> so yeah, no, but no. Again, I had a lot of really positive things to say about it. Exactly. No, it's a very, very bad movie. But I can tell you that there is some shining light about it, it sprinkled throughout there of that two-hour madness. Um, but I do understand people's hatred. I understand why women like it. And quite frankly, why are you mad at the fucking author? She capitalized on this shit and now she's a fucking millionaire. I wish... I wish I wish exactly. I Listen, if I wrote Fifty Shades of Grey and I got it fucking published, I would be I would be honored if they said, written by Chase Lee. Are you fucking serious? I'd be like, yeah, I, I wrote it, whatever. I can, I can pay off my student loan and buy a house. Like, I mean, seriously, like, it... You know what's really strange is I, I found this out the other day. Uh, all you people that... Uh, don't know this they're listening E.L. James the author of this book who is probably having sex problems obviously that's why she wrote it she's actually married to a screenwriter so so Josh I want you uh, to imagine the conversation she had when she first approached him of the idea it's kind of like uh, hey husband of mine um, I have this idea and it's about a woman who loves a billionaire and uh, she's into some BDSM after she loses her virginity to him uh, what do you think? And then, you know, he kind of responds like, that's the worst piece of shit ever. But guess what? I wrote Howard the Duck and I haven't had a hint, a hit since then. And we, we need the money. So go ahead and publish that. So, uh, I think he, he was probably, he actually probably gave her notes on it and then she probably got it published. But I found that pretty interesting that she is married to a screenwriter and she probably went to him for that idea and he approved it. So, uh, thank you. Thank you, sir, for, uh, letting her publish that and grace that upon us. Um, to wrap up my, yeah, yeah I, I know, right? You know, me and Josh are the minorities. That's right. Spread this podcast around and know that the two gentlemen talking right now actually kind of enjoyed it. But overall, like, like I said, it's a very trashy movie. I don't like the dialogue. I do not like Jamie Dorn at all. A lot of arcs, on, uh, you know, not completed. I hate the fact they ended on that cliffhanger, but it still entices me to watch the rest. It was shot well, 
But ultimately, guys, it's still very trashy. I can't get it to fresh. I may have to go 5 out of 10. That's still very high for me. I thought I was going to completely yeah. rip this thing a new asshole, pun intended. Um, but it's not bad. It's just an average movie, guys. An average Hollywood romance. That's all it is. So that's our thoughts on Fifty Shades of Grey. Uh, man, Josh, we had a lengthy conversation on that shit. Um, oh, yeah, man. I was, I was excited. As soon as you said you wanted to talk Fifty Shades of Grey, I had already <laughs> seen it. I was like... Hell yeah, I got a lot to say about this. Do, do you, this, is, this is definitely the talk of the town right now, this movie. Oh yeah. Okay. Like, do, do, you guys, do you guys see what I have to deal with? Like, I've been trying to get Josh on this podcast ever since the birth of this, which was like a year and a half ago. And you know, you know, Josh is... was Fifty Shades of Grey, man. All he had to come to me was say, you know what, do you want to talk Fifty Shades of Grey? <laughs> of course. Like, Hell yes, I do. <laughs> exactly. Like, I... I've a uh, uh, Josh is a very a very busy dude. He's got a lot of stuff going on. He's very popular on his channel, so he's not going to deal with you know a peasant like me. So I'm like, so I'm just like, hey Josh, like Fifty Shades of Grey, you have to come on this time. Like this this is the one. And he was like, you know what, fuck it, I will. And I was like, all right, I totally got you this time. So uh, yeah, that's our thoughts on Fifty Shades of Grey, guys. But here's the deal: I don't even care what I have to say. I care what Josh has to say, but. What do you guys have to say? I want you to comment in that place that's right below my voice and Josh's voice and let us know know what you thought of Fifty Shades of Grey. We are the minority. Josh really liked it. Not really liked it, but he liked it. And I'm, liked it. I'm okay with it. It's just average. So what do you guys think? Did you see it? Did your girlfriend drag you to it? Did you go by yourself in a trench coat with uh, some lotion in your hand? I want to know. So... Fifty Shades of Grey, cannot wait for the sequel. I never thought I'd say that to find out what the fuck happens in the story. Coming out next year in 2016. Now, with that being said, Josh knows... How much money did it make? Tell me how much money it made. Exactly. I want to know really badly. Josh wants to know. Because we both know that this thing was going to bank regardless, but how much did it make? Okay. Good question. I know. It's a, it's a very good question that I've been pondering since I, uh, since I saw it. So... Let's go over the box office results for the weekend for the top five at the box office. Coming in at number five, we have Jupiter Ascending, aka an elf saves a hot chick, uh, and it I made. Seen this one yet, so. I have not either, nor do I want to. Um, Jupiter Ascending made nine point four million, and its domestic total is. If my internet will go, it's up to thirty two mil right now, and worldwide. It, Oh, it's it's terrible. And worldwide is that wasn't that like um, like an almost two hundred million dollar movie? I'm I'll get to that in just a second. Okay. War, <laughs> war, worldwide right now it's got ninety one million <clears throat> on a budget of drum roll please one seventy six. Now you guys know the drill. You have to you have to double that to break even because the theaters take half of the profit. So double that, uh Josh, you're smarter than me. What's uh is it, uh three Close to 350, just over 350, I think it needs to make. Yeah, just to break even. To break, guys, to break fucking even. This is the third flop in a row for the Wachowskis. Guys, obviously Warner Brothers has given you enough shots that more people would. Just stop. You're not going to make another Matrix. I'm sorry, but like, you're just not. Just stop. Please. Channing Tatum is wearing fucking Keebler elf ears. What were you. I would love to see the Wachowskis go back and do something smaller though i would love to see them trying because i mean like they are good at the the world building stuff that they like to do yeah i know i know there are some hardcore fans that are actually really into uh cloud atlas uh but i i haven't seen it so i don't have an opinion on that one but i know some people who were really into it and i, I would love to see them you know do something good again but I, I haven't seen a movie i like from them since the first matrix movie so exactly and it it's the third flop in a row for warner brothers like they should be knowing yeah, by now I, yeah i was gonna say i, I don't think they're gonna make another big studio sci-fi again oh hell no for the next little while hell no and guys they have their netflix series coming out this summer so maybe that will kind of get them back on the map but until then this is awful number four american sniper this thing is a fucking juggernaut and it made 16 more million this weekend Thing will not die, eh? No, like what the fuck, man? Like domestically, it's made three hundred and four million. Which, by the way, wrap your heads around this, folks. Regardless of what you think of the movie, it is the most profitable R-rated war film to be released, and that means it beat Saving Private Ryan. You listen. I didn't really care for the movie at all. Like I kind of hated it, but yeah, it just I hated it too. exactly. So it just kind of shows you. 
the power of this fucking movie, man. Like the budget was sixty million. You double that, just one twenty. All it all it did is it, is it tapped into the support the troops community. So you know everyone thought I have to be a good American. I have to go watch you know America shoot up a bunch of Iraqis. <laughs> exactly, and and uh, just to let you guys know, this is an exclusive. This this is what Canada thinks about us, folks. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Josh represents everyone in Canada right now, and he just spoke Canada's yeah. truth right now. So, um, hey, the American box office, you guys keep doing it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, thank you. <laughs> so, uh, number three is um, SpongeBob Two, SpongeBob Out of Water. Uh, I did not see that. I, I liked it. It was it was cute. It was enjoyable. I, I really I liked it more than uh, the first one. It was actually really funny. It was like a really trippy acid film just like the first one was but this one's like even trippier and i was, it was like partially live action right e, sort the, of the last 20 minutes oh okay right the trailer it looked like the most uh, like exactly i said that last week and i was like are you fucking serious like your whole trailer is marketing towards this when you're honestly just the third act of the film like it doesn't make any sense to me but That's interesting. well now i want to watch the movie i want to watch it really bad now actually it, it, it it's really fun i enjoyed it it's 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 not something that i'm just like Ooh, SpongeBob, fantastic! But like, I grew up with SpongeBob. It came out. It, the first episode appeared when I was nine. So like, I under, I liked the like old humor of SpongeBob. That weird, uh, just weird fucking bizarre humor. Um, and that's what the second movie kind okay, of. Clearly, I was gonna say clearly people do too, right? This is doing pretty well at the box office, right? It's actually uh better th- doing more profit than the first one. So. Cool. Uh, right now it's at 93 domestic worldwide it's at 139 on a budget of 74 so it's actually just about to break even and i think uh since there's really no kids films coming out anytime soon it's this got a little while to dominate oh yeah that, dude that, uh, that audience it's definitely got some legs for sure and like i said i really enjoyed it if, if you guys want to see a, kind of a kooky weird kids movie i would suggest that one so here we go guys number one and number two you know what's number one and you know what's number two yeah. But how much did they make? So number two, Kingsman, The Secret Service. Josh, give me an over-under of how much you think it made. Ooh, okay. So I, I think people were projecting it at, at close to like, – they, they said close to 30. So I'd, I'd say it made low, low 30s, maybe 31 or 32. Ooh, shit. This is why I bring people on like this, folks, because they are good at guessing. It made – Thirty-five point six million dollars, and that's actually really yeah. good. Like that, 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 that's yeah, that, that's higher than I think people expected. Good it, for it. Exactly. Like it. It's because yeah, when was the last time we saw like two R-rated films dominate the box office? Um, oh shit! Um, I, like I can't even think. Uh, like, that, 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 like considering the second place film out of the two R-rated films is thirty-five, doing better than the children's movie. That's insane. Yeah, like I do. Yeah, now you raise up an inter- interesting question. I think maybe the '90s probably was the last time that happened. I, when I saw the numbers, I was like, "Damn!" Even like in the midst of Fifty Shades of Grey and SpongeBob, this still did pretty decent. And you know, it, right now domestically it's at 35, and worldwide it's at 79 on a budget of 80. So, ooh, it's only about halfway to go before to break even, but. I think with the word of mouth on this one, I think this one will actually do very, very well for Matthew Vaughn and company. So I, I've i heard nothing but good things, and like I'm going to see it soon, and people are like continuing to see it over and over again. So I think this one will actually have some very strong legs. Um, so I, I'm really looking forward to it. So $35 million, good job, Kingsman. Fuck, man. All right, so number number one is uh, obvious. It it's obviously... Uh, uh, Wedding Ringer tied with Taken f- 3, tied with uh, uh, Into the Woods, tied with Imitation Game. No, I'm just fucking with you guys. It's Fifty Shades of Grey. Um, Josh, over under, how much did it make? Ooh, okay. Um, this is a, this was a tough one because I think a lot of people were, were talking about it, it possibly breaking some records for R-rated films. Um, and American Sniper already did that this year, right? What was it opening like ninety one or something like that? That's yeah, it, pretty... its opening was like ninety one or something like that. But it was the it was like the biggest uh, for the month of January, I think. Right. Um, hmm. I I would guess uh, I would say above above seventy. I would say maybe mid seventies, like seventy five or seventy six. No way! You you didn't get it, but you were pretty damn close. 
81. 81. Oh. You were you were very close. Really? I didn't I didn't think it would break 80. I was almost certain it wouldn't break 80. Good for it. Yeah, no, I I think with the pre-sales, like cuz I bought my tickets online way before it even came out cuz I knew it was going to be busy. And so I think with the pre-sales that definitely helped out a lot. And its budget was 40 million. It's already broke even, but here's the deal. Um it's world okay. it's worldwide 239 in one weekend. No way. Yeah, 200 That's so much money uh yeah. worldwide. Yeah, 239. So it did, it did like what? Like almost double in uh like not America? Like not domestically, like foreign? It did double. In in, in uh in the states, it made eighty one, which means it already broke even just with us. And then four, the weekend, right? yeah, yeah. F- foreign was one one fifty eight or something like that. So, yeah, <laughs> it made like one hundred sixty million in profit on its first weekend. Yes. Jesus <laughs> Christ. Hey, guys, listen. This is the American dream right here. Fifty Shades of Gray. This why is. Didn't I write Fifty Shades of Gray. Tell me why. I I don't know what the fuck, man. Like we should have been on that shit like twenty years ago. Uh, no, like holy shit, man. That's I insane. I you know I'll I'll, I'll write mine, um, and it will be uh it will focus on one sexual act in BDSM territory. I think I'll uh have it to where like this girl meets this guy and like he fists her like constantly. Just, just constantly in the vag and the butt, and I, I'm gonna make it into like something really unique, and it's gonna sell because we're America and we make trash. <laughs> and I can, I can tell you that in confidence. I am not afraid. So that is it. This um, for the box office results for the weekend, guys. But I want to thank you guys for listening. I want to thank Josh Lewis for coming on. This guy is a cool motherfucker, uh, and he knows what he's talking about. So Josh, with that being said, one more time, where can people find you online? If you people want to find me, you can find me on uh, YouTube at Sywell Productions or Josh Lewis Reviews. Um, but unfortunately, I am taking a little bit of a, a break on YouTube. I'm working on some projects, doing some exciting things that could possibly lead to some big stuff. Uh, so if you want to find my written stuff, you can find me on Letterboxd at the Josh L. And you can also follow me on Twitter where I post all of the content that I make, including... Uh, this podcast. So, if you want to listen to this podcast again, there's a link to it on my Twitter. Well, thank you, sir. You you definitely do not have to spread the love on this podcast. It's okay. I just appreciate you guys coming on. It's been fun. I don't think I've ever done like a, like a live podcast in this way. And a live podcast is a, a lot more fun than doing a recording one and going and editing it later. Oh, yeah. Like, no, because like what, whatever you fucking say, I'm posting on air. So <laughs> there is no take back. So whatever comes out of your, your mouth hole, that's exactly what comes out. And I think uh, that's the method I like doing the most. Because, you know, like I have the option to record an episode on this uh, app that I used or whatever. But I just, I don't know. I think it's more fun to do it live because it's kind of like, you know, it's happening. People can listen to it right now. And what, like, seriously, I, uh, I don't know if you guys know this and Josh will be the first one to find out, but like, I don't write down anything for these podcasts. Like I have like a general outline of what we're talking about. Like the stuff I sent to Josh to prepare for the episode is exactly what I have written down, but I don't have, it was just the names of things. It was like, we're going to talk trailers. Here are the names of the movie trailers. Exactly. Like I, I don't, I don't tell them what, like if I liked it, if I disliked it, I just, whatever flows out of my mouth, which is mostly word vomit, diarrhea mixture. That is what happens. Cause I don't, I don't write anything guys. I basically just kind of wing it and improv it, but that's what uh, makes it cool. Cause me and Josh are, huge movie lovers and that's why this podcast works because we know we breathe movies like that's why we can kind of wing these things so um yeah josh yeah, well luckily enough for me i was i uh, had my 50 shades of gray review to reference to find my points to make sure i didn't miss anything but uh yeah for the most part this was just me talking other than uh, some of the 50 shades of gray points i made yeah like i haven't i haven't written a review of that i haven't done a review of that and so this is actually the only this this is my review so uh it will go up on my youtube channel so speaking of that so if i sounded a lot crazier or a lot more on point that's because i had lots of prep time to get ready what i wanted to say exactly exactly (laughs) so uh see josh had prep time i don't and that's why he's more successful than i am so uh if you guys want to follow me on uh this 
uh, website here. You can click that follow button on Spreaker. You can get up to dates on live shows when I post these things, whatever. If you guys want to follow my Twitter for some weird shit I post, it's uh, at Real Chase Lee. If you guys want to like my Facebook page, um, I do movie reviews, podcasts, whatever. I have giveaways. It's uh, Facebook.com slash Real Reviews with Chase Lee. YouTube is YouTube.com slash Shabootnik75. Capital S, lowercase h a b o o t n i k seven five, and you can find web series, short films, podcasts, whatever the fuck. You will have plenty of things to watch while you're shitting on the toilet. So, I want to thank Josh one more time for coming on, and hopefully, I can blackmail you. I mean, uh, ask you again to come on again. Oh yeah, man. All right, so <laughs> that that was Josh's closing words. So uh, <laughs> I want to thank you guys. My motto. It, it, it really is his motto in life. It's like on his website, uh, f- first page. So uh, I want to thank you guys for uh, listening. Uh, you guys are awesome. I love you all. Um, next Sunday is my live coverage of the Oscars. That's right. All four, three. Yeah, those are happening. Exactly, right? I, I know. Like I, I looked at my calendar. I was like, dear God, the Oscars are happening next week. So uh, I will have my live coverage, the whole three, four-hour show, whatever. I will actually have a live coverage of the whole thing, and I'll have um, people drop by, and they can have their two cents or whatever, but that will be the next week's episode. So I will see you guys next week for another episode of Real Me and Colon, a movie podcast. I'm Chase Lee. That's fucking Josh Lewis. Go follow him. He's a cool dude. I will see you guys next week. Peace out, everyone.